next speaker will be Dr. Malik. He grew up uh, in Long Island, New York until the age of 17 where he joined his, uh, with his family, um, where he completed medical school in Saudi Arabia. Uh, upon completion of medical school, he returned to the U.S. to complete his internal medicine residency at Piedmont, uh, Piedmont Athens Regional Center in Georgia. He is currently a second year neurocritical care fellow. Um, he is planning to uh, return back to Buffalo, New York this, uh, this June after completing his fellowship. Um, today he will be speaking about the ICU complications of post-TNK. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me and also for setting me up to go after Dr. Burtz and uh, Dr. Yeager, so <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so basically, the talk today um, is going to be about uh, the management of complications that can happen with TNK. And we've been hearing now about how we've transitioned to TNK. And, and uh, from the, the presentations this morning, we can say that this is going to be something that is the past, present, and future of stroke thrombolytic therapy. And so the question now is, um, what are the immediate complications and what, what can we do for those complications? I think, of course, this is 15 minutes, so by no means is it an extensive discussion of what happens in the ICU, but I think it can give us a good idea of um, why our patients need to be managed very closely, especially in the immediate post um, thrombolytic therapy period. So what I hope to talk about today is basically discuss what are the, the very dangerous complications that require our patients to be monitored very closely, and then briefly see whether or not TNK uh, and TPA have similar complications as we make this transition, um, and then, of course, go into what exactly can we do in the ICU when our patients have these complications, and then maybe even briefly just talk about some of the newer things or some things that may not be applied right now but possibly in the future. Um, so in terms of common complications, there's really two buckets, the two um, most dangerous complications that we hear commonly about that require ICU intervention are our hemorrhages and angioedema. And so um, for the purpose of this presentation, we'll focus mostly on the intracranial hemorrhage, but you have, um, of course, life-threatening bleed extracranially as well. And then there's also a breakdown in terms of classification. You have the symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage and then uh, parenchymal hematomas as well. And, um, radiographically, they have different classifications. Um, the most common one is HS1, HS2, and those are basically uh, parenchymal hematomas, petechial uh, hemorrhages, and then you have the symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, which is basically any kind of hemorrhage um, that is resulting in a neurological change. Um, so just briefly to kind of talk about what the um, Pathophysiology is because it does kind of help us understand what we do for management for these patients. Uh, in terms of what thrombolytic therapies are doing is basically the, the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin is being blocked. And what that does then is that it prevents, um, uh, uh, it allows fibrin degradation and breakdown of clots. But so there are, in terms of thrombolytics, there are those that are fibrin selective and non selective because fibrinogen and fibrin are both responsible here for clot formation. And so uh, TPA and, and TNK are what we call the fibrin selective thrombolytics, and streptokinase, urokinase, those are things we call non fibrin selective. Um, and what that means, really, and, and I think Dr. Mishra briefly mentioned this as well, why TNK is so much more potent or Theoretically, why it could be more potent is that it, it's, select, it's uh, fibrin selectivity is much stronger than that of TPA. So the reason for all of this is that if you know kind of why or how we are breaking down these clots, then you can talk about why, what would happen if we start bleeding, and that's kind of the, the purpose of talking about this. The interesting thing about angioedema in um, post-thrombolytic therapy is that it's actually... Uh, a lot of data suggests that it's not um, 
related really to IgE or, or uh, allergy angioedema, and it's actually more on the bradykinin pathway. So it's, it's similar really to what you get when you have patients with ACE inhibitor or, or hereditary angioedema. And there, there are some studies and there are some data that actually suggest that concomitant use of ACE inhibitors actually is an independent risk factor for um, the development of uh, orolingual angioedema in our thrombolytic patients. Um, the question then becomes, though, uh, and this was very well addressed by Dr. Mishra earlier, is that so we sw we're switching now to TNK. Does TNK have these side effects? And, and uh, for the purpose of this discussion, it's not really whether it's better or worse, but really does it even have the same side effects? And obviously, theoretically, it's the same. It's, an, it's a thrombolytic therapy, so it should. And when you look at the data, it, it does suggest that uh, interparenchymal hem uh, parenchymal hemorrhage, symptomatic um, intracranial hemorrhage, and angioedema do occur uh, with TNK. Um, so then in that sense, what do you do? So obviously with uh, all patients uh, that require critical care management, um, the workup, initial workup when you see something like this is, is vital. Um, and there's really two steps. So one of the interesting things is if you look at guidelines from 2018 for stroke, um, the first thing they'll say is stop the infusion. The, the funny thing now is that now we're transitioning to TNK, so really there is no infusion to stop at this point. It's just a push. I mean, theoretically, let's say your, your patient starts to develop angioedema while you're pushing, then I would recommend please stop pushing. But, um, but yeah, there, there is no role for stopping any infusion at this point. In terms of uh, the workup for intracranial hemorrhage, uh, obviously all of this happens at the same time in an ICU. You're not just obtaining a lab. You're doing all, this thing, all these things at the same time. Uh, you're getting your CBC, your electrolytes, your INR. Fibrinogen plays a role, in, as we talked about, right? So um, there are data that suggest uh, fibrinogen less than 200. And a lot of, and we'll talk about some of the medications that are, are possible to use, and a lot of that data suggests that if your fibrinogen is less than 200, then use those medications. Um, the other interesting thing is that, um, you know, this is something that you learn all the time in, in critical care is airway, breathing, circulation. But really, if you uh, talk about newer guidelines and the way you're supposed to manage ACLS now is actually airway circulation and breathing. And so the first thing for any of these patients is to make sure that we have adequate airway and then to see if they have a pulse before going on to uh, working on their breathing. And that becomes more important when we talk about angioedema. Um, in terms of what we can do for these patients, so there, there are a lot of debate about blood pressure, about uh, consulting neurosurgery. Um, so to, just to talk about blood pressure, if you look at uh, all of our data, most of our data is extrapolated from uh, intracranial hemorrhage patients, not specifically those that have had hemorrhagic transformation. And there, there, are, there are debates about, you know, uh, stricter blood pressure versus uh, more liberalization of blood pressure. And if you look at some of the European guidelines for intracranial hemorrhage specifically, 160 is actually... Uh, suggested. I think the most important thing here is, and the reason kind of that this can't be a more, I mean, this is a short 15-minute discussion. Technically, this can be an hour-long discussion about what, what kind of blood pressure parameters and talking about p individualizing our care to our patients. And I think that, you know, referring back to Dr. Vahidi's presentation about, you know, in general, our patients matter and kind of individualizing care, but even in the acute setting, right, each patient is different. The size of the bleed, the presentation, where the bleed is, what other factors are involved. Um, and organ reperfusion is also an important aspect of all of this, right? So if a patient's blood pressure is in the 200s and you try to bring it below 140 almost immediately, you will get end organ damage in terms of your kidneys and other things. The question then is, you're talking to a neurologist about kidneys, so I don't necessarily know. Um, in terms of neurosurgical consultation, so um, there are good data and, and that suggests that uh, for many of these patients, consulting neurosurgery. Uh, so some of the big trials, there was a trial in the 90s, Gusto, I think they, they analyzed the, the patient population from that trial and saw that patients um, that had had neurosurgical evacuation. And of course, going into the details of how big these bleeds are, you know, that's outside of the scope of this presentation, but, but neurosurgical evacuation in those patients did have um, uh, 
positive outcomes in terms of 30-day mortality, but not really difference in terms of um, modified Rankin. And again, that was just one study. So it goes back to the size of the bleed, and, and like if you have petit, small particular hemorrhage, you're not going to hopefully uh, bother our neurosurgery colleagues if there is no neurological change or anything like that, and you believe you know, that the patient can be managed. But however, obviously large intracranial hemorrhage uh, inter, uh, with ICP, um, changes in ICP that, you know, there, sh there should be, the role really should be to get the help you need and if that includes neurosurgery. Um, in terms of medication, so we talked a little bit about this, so uh, thrombolytic therapy, um, the question then is uh, when and how to use medications and if you look just purely on the guidelines, the cryoprecipitate, uh, trans transexamic acid and aminocarboric acid are mentioned even in the stroke guidelines as therapies and a lot of places and institutions will kind of use a cutoff for fibrinogen in less than one. 150 or less than 200. Um, the, if you think about cryoprecipitate, it's just factors, and that's really what you're doing. So the question then does become, again, this is all patient-based. In, in, in a lot of situations, you can use these medications and should, but if there's a small particular hemorrhage, that's not something that you'll be doing. Um, there are um, case reports of other, uh, fresh frozen plasma is probably not gonna be a good idea in, in any case. And uh, again, if you're in a resource poor setting and there's something that you need to do, that, again, that's, you're giving factors, coagulation factors. But there are case reports about um, K-Centra, prothrombin complex, specific factors, the clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, and then even activated factor 8. But these are, there. I think really it's because there aren't, um, large sample sizes of patients with hemorrhagic transformation. So the data aren't really that great about what you can and can't do. And it's mostly um, watching the patient in the ICU, watching their ICP, controlling their blood pressure, um, and then moving from there, there, there are medications you can use. Um, so in terms of uh, oral lingual angioedema, it's very similar the same way. Um, uh, obtaining labs is important in that situation as well because, you know, uh, if it's even there's a question about whether this is swelling secondary to your thrombolytic therapy. If you think about the timeline, right, most of these are gonna happen within 24 hours, 36 hours. And so theoretically, you could have given something else in the ICU. Um, the patient could have some other reaction in the ICU that's not related to thrombolytic therapy. So it's important to kind of parse that out and get all the things you can at the same time you're gonna be managing your airway, their circulation and breathing. Um, there are some uh, important aspects about airway. Uh, you know, if the patient needs to be intubated, the ideal way, and in most cases this happens anyways, is going to be a video laryngoscope or direct laryngoscopy. Um, one of the things to note is that obviously if that's not possible, then uh, um, nasotracheal intubation is an option, but you have to remember these are patients who did receive thrombolytic therapy. And so epistaxis and bleeding is going to be a significant risk factor of that. Uh, it's very unlikely that the, the size and the uh, significance of the angioedema would be such that you wouldn't be able to get airway, but in some situations, rare as that may, it's possible. But again, to do, to do cricothyroidotomies in a patient like this, it should be noted that the patient just received thrombolytic therapy and are high risk for bleeding. Um, uh, and then, of course, the other question is, are there medications? So this is important when you talk about the background of why angioedema happens in these patients and talking about how it's not allergy-mediated. And so if you look at our patient population with ACE inhibitor angioedema or hereditary angioedema, a lot of the mainstay th treatments are, haven't really been shown to be that superior over just watching the patient and making sure that you're providing uh, supportive care. But Again, in most situations, in most institutions, they basically have these um, order sets that, that are going to be implemented, uh, steroid therapy, epinephrine, and, um, Benadryl, Famotidine, Ranitidine uh, are all options. So, but again, most, most situations, as long as you're uh, doing the ACB of, of critical care, technically these medications aren't really going to make that much difference. Um, 
So I guess the other question is, is are there anything else that, that can be done or looked at? So in terms of actually angioedema, there are some interesting things in, in the ACE inhibitor population as well. And this isn't by any means uh, normal practice or used, but there are newer medications. Itidabent is a uh, bradykinin 2 receptor antagonist. It's called furazir. It's used in ACE inhibitor. Um, Again, expense and, and really the fact that it's not commonly seen, it's not pra like general practice, but these are things that may eventually in the future be seen. And there are trace reports of its use in post-thrombolytic angioedema. Um, the other question, and I think this comes up sometimes, is the use of imaging modalities to kind of parse out some of the things that may or may not be intracranial hemorrhage. Um, in patients where we are, for example, large vessel occlusion that are receiving both thrombolytic therapy and um, uh, uh, mechanical thrombectomy, these patients are going to get contrast. And so in some situations, uh, in, you, you know, there may be a, a a point where you get a CT scan in the immediate 24-hour period where you're going to see a hyperdensity that may not actually be bleeding. And, you know, our radiologists, neurologists that have seen many of these, uh, in most cases, should be able to parse it out. But I think there are newer imaging modalities. Uh, I say new, but obviously not very new, but they are being used, uh, such as dual energy CT. And dual energy CT, if you look at this example right here on um, uh, on the left-hand side where my arrow is, you'll see it's uh, a non-contrast head CT um, showing an area of hyperdensity, but the dual energy CT does show you that that hyperdensity is in fact contrast. So, um, but these are just some things that are, again, not necessarily in practice, but a possibility of these coming as we move forward in uh, critical care. Um, so yeah, again, not an extensive uh, uh, management strategy, but just an overall of what needs to be done or what happens in an ICU. Basically, we do know that TNK causes the same, uh, has the uh, ability to have the same side effects as TPA. Um, so workup is always um, getting all the laboratory workup you need, making sure the patient has uh, uh, airway breathing, airway circulation breathing. Cryoprecipitate and uh, TXA and um, uh, carport, uh, amino carport acid are, are in the guidelines for reversal. Um, and then for angioedema, you can use the, the common steroids, epinephrine, but really it's just watching the patient, making sure that you're supporting them. And then, you know, maybe years down the line, there are other medications or, or strategies. Um, thank you.